now i would request uh, uh, dr samuel sadian uh, he is a postdoctoral fellow center for humanities research university of western cape south africa and also research associate institute for social and economic research so over to you samuel okay thank you very much um just one question um i'm going to I have a presentation that I can share. Um, will that help? Otherwise, I'm going to read it anyway, so it's not necessary. Um, OK, I'll share it and see if it works. Um, just a second. Yeah, is that visible? Yes, it's visible. Okay. All right, great. <clears throat> OK, so. Um, yeah, first things first, just many thanks for the invitation. It's really a great pleasure to be here, and I've really enjoyed um, listening into the conversations. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll offer <clears throat> my short contribution. Um, there is some background noise, unfortunately, where I am. and I, I can't escape it. Um, if that bothers you, please let me know, but I'll assume it's all right. Um, OK, so. Um, yeah, I'll just go straight ahead. It should fit in under 15 minutes, but please just intervene if you see me going over time. So um, the title is North-South Entanglement as a Problem for Critical Social Theory. <clears throat> My argument is basically that um, mainstream critical theory emerging from the Frankfurt School or theory that is directly um, building on Frankfurt School theory itself um, has remained a source of inspiration for many of us today, um, both because of its ability to articulate emancipatory concerns um, in very pro sort of progressive and, and stimulating and original ways, but also because it's committed to theorizing freedom and domination within very concrete historical conjunctures. And I want to say that judged by these standards, which are theory's own standards, it isn't entirely unfair to claim that theory has to a large extent suffered from a certain arbitrariness with regard to the second historical criterion of actually inserting our emancipatory interests into um, a very detailed um, exploration of specific historical conjunctures. Um, so I'm gonna argue that this shows up in the very striking disinterest in the conjoined fates of northern and southern countries. Um, but I'm also going to argue that recent theorization of entanglement and of externalization seem to point in the direction of a remedy. So I'm not going to go into much detail here. Many of you will be familiar with this. But um, many of the um, economic and sociopolitical concerns that arise in first generation Frankfurt School thought have remained with us in a number of different ways. Um, commodification, and then later also quite a dense theorization of consumerism um, were part of this theory and were considered major pathologies within it. Um, and this line of critique obviously grew in large part out of a creative application, but also a development of Marxian ideology critique, and particularly um, the theory of commodity fetishism. Um, there were also um, Weberian, broadly speaking, Weberian elements within this theory. Um, and there you see also a critique of instrumental reason and bureaucratic administration. Although, of course, fear of large states has now largely migrated over to the right. At any rate, many speakers have already pointed this out, but um, I want to explore this major problem, which is that all the theorizing that we see here was largely limited to diagnosing problems that arise within North Atlantic society and within North Atlantic history. Um, so to put the point a little bit differently, um, and of course to use slightly outmoded uh, terminology, um, we could say that both the first and the second worlds appear in first generation Frankfurt School critical theory. At the same time, however, um, we find that what was then called the third world um, is almost entirely missing. And this in turn led to a number of oversights 
not least the oversight of um, struggles for decolonization and um, the emergence of pan-African or pan-Arab and non-aligned movements and a number of other very influential countercultures and political movements that were producing their own extremely complex critical theory and practice. Um, so there are fragments of this um, within first-generation Frankfurt theorization, but um, practically nothing of any real substance. And on top of that, what we do find is quite clearly problematic. So I'll just quickly read a snippet from um, Minima Moralia. That's at um, Adorno's book of 1951. Fragments came out in 1944. So Adorno writes, there is some reason to fear that the involvement of non-Western peoples in the conflicts of industrial society, long overdue in itself, will be less to the benefit of the liberated peoples than to that of rationally improved production and communications and a modestly raised standard of living. Instead of expecting miracles of the pre-capitalist peoples, all the nations should be on their guard against their unimaginative, indolent taste for everything proven and for the successes of the West. Yeah, I don't need to point out that um, the, you know, the language and the assumptions there are quite problematic. So, but I want to take this a bit further and point to four problems. Um, so why exactly is this a problem for Frankfurt School theory? And here I'm, of course, talking about the first generation. And I want to argue that the problem here isn't just the obvious one, that of overlooking vast swathes of human experience, or the dismissiveness implied in doing so, and the language itself. Um, so there are at least four problems that weaken the theory even on its own terms. And these um, two of these concern the analysis of domination and others relate to the analysis of capitalism. So firstly, um, challenging the self-image of the North by portraying its post-enlightenment history as one of barbarism rather than progress would seem quite naturally to lead into an analysis of settler colonial or imperial domination and exploitation. Obviously, this was not less barbarous than European fascism or other forms of totalitarianism, that, and it also prefigured some of these techniques in certain important ways. The second problem is that um, general attention to actually existing forms of domination would seem to suggest that commodity fetishism and instrumental reason have never been the only significant social pathologies accompanying the spread of capitalism. And of course, here in particular, there would... Um, seems to be a need for theorizing raw violence as well in much greater detail. And thirdly, while capitalism is indeed a ubiquitous concept in the theory, capital accumulation implicitly um, is viewed as endogenous to the North. I'm not going to go into the problems there, but they should be obvious. And basically, it, it is a form of mystification to not consider the global context of capital accumulation in any serious way. And then a fourth problem is that um, such analysis would also seem to suggest the salience of race rather than only class as a tool for diagnosing social stratification and domination. Um, so this would seem to have meant viewing the European Jewish problem. And of course, that wasn't the only racial problem in Europe. That was the one that they were considering. Taking this and viewing it as continuous with other globally ubiquitous forms of racial domination. And anti-racist and anti-colonial thought had long been available to um, people living at the time in which this theory was emerging. So the materials were there, but they were overlooked. And again, one only sees glimpses of such things. Um, so, um, for instance, and it's interesting that the earlier speakers have also chosen Marcuse, um, in his Repressive Tolerance of 1969, or An Era and Civilization, in the second edition of that, 1966 in English, um, he did indeed connect affluent northern consumer society with northern student revolts and with southern anti-colonial insurgencies. But again, um, note the obviously problematic assumptions in terminology. So, for example, he writes, historical backwardness may again become the historical chance of turning the wheel of progress to another direction. The affluent society has now demonstrated that it is a society at war. 
If its citizens have not noticed it, its victims certainly have. Right, and then I want to just briefly consider some ways of reframing. And of course, um, there have been many generations of Frankfurt School thought, and also thought that has um, been fairly directly influenced by this thought and has chosen to build upon it. Um, and so I want to jump straight into the present and look very selectively at some of this thought um, with specific reference to three contemporary thinkers. And the first of these, um, has, is Wolfgang Strieck, who has been and remains very influential um, as somebody who's updating Frankfurt School thought about capitalism and about its socio-political effects. Okay, Strieck basically <clears throat> um, endeavors to update 1970s Frankfurt School crisis theory. Um, that partially emerged out of a critique of Habermas's crisis theory of the 70s, and subsequently, Strick is also engaged in interesting debates with Habermas. Okay, so Strick was um, studied, well, he studied at Frankfurt and um, also under Adorno to some extent. And the, his writing um, came out uh, as a sort of byproduct of doing the Adorno lectures at the Frankfurt School in 2012. Um, okay, I'm not going to go into many of the details, but I do want to just focus on some of them. Um, that relate to the theme of the conference. So basically, um, Strick looks very helpfully, not just at the 1980s, um, where we see the obvious emergence of what we would now generally discuss in terms of neoliberalism. So obviously the um, Reagan and Thatcher revolutions and many other things. Strick knows that the, the, this itself was precipitated by other events during the 70s. Um, and for instance, he's particularly concerned with inflation. And I won't go into the details, but in that, this inflationary crisis was indeed an enormous problem. Um, it really roiled the entire global economy during the 1970s. And what's interesting, though, is just that Strick doesn't ever consider the global context of this. I'm sorry, you have three minutes. So oh, three minutes. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so I won't go into details then, but um, there is an entire backdrop to this that Shrek never considers, right? Um, but another um, theorist who's done a lot to address these kind of problems is Stefan Lessenich, who we saw obviously speaking yesterday, and um, some of you I'm sure will know his, his writing. And basically Lessenich now the head of the Frankfurt School is um, doing very detailed work to show how northern affluence is a direct consequence of um, externalizing um, problems onto the south. And he makes this very central and analyzes how everyday life um, reproduces these things. Um, and then a third thinker that's of great value is Peter Wagner. Wagner's also worked very closely with the Frankfurt School, particularly with ha Axel Harnett when he was head. Um, and again, with um, Wagner's work, you see this very detailed um, theorization of northern and southern entanglements and how the two feed into one another. Wagner also works very closely with southern theorists um, when doing so. And then just to finish up, um, I wanted to say that in addition to these kind of developments in Frankfurt and Frankfurt associated thoughts, you also have interesting new concepts surfacing and particularly the concepts of entanglement and externalization. Okay. Um, and I'm here, I'm thinking of Lessenich and Wagner's work. They don't coin these terms, but um, they put them to interesting use. Um, and the, so Wagner's work looks at North South entanglements as part of his recent shift. Um, to theorizing the unequal burdens of environmental destruction and also of the energetic presuppositions of world modernity. And this is part of a much larger project in which he's been looking at world regions, particularly Africa, Latin America, and um, Europe, and comparing them in even terms. And then Lessenich also brings in this very interesting concept of externalization, which obviously arises in economics, but he puts it to totally different views to again show how labor and environmental burdens are systematically externalized from the north to the south so that the environmental and labor burdens 
are carried by the South and how this is a fundamental precondition for affluence and consumer societies in the North. All right, great. And, and that's exactly where I'll leave it. So thank you very much. I'll stop sharing. Thank you, Sam.